thank you all for having us. Um, it's a distinct honor and a pleasure for Jennifer and I to have Origami in the Garden in here in this beautiful space that you all uh, obviously have a lot of passion for. And it's a lot of work that goes into it uh, from Sarah's perspective and uh, Ed's and the education department, the horticulture. We've been working together for over a year sort of planning this, so it's always exciting to see it come together. I just wanted to give a little background about Jennifer and I and sort of how this all happened, which is some common questions that we get along the way, and we thought this would be a great opportunity, especially <coughs> since it might be raining for us to just do a little slide presentation that we normally would have done a year ago to sort of prime uh, this experience, but we're going to give it to you today. Um, most bronze sculptures that, that you may have seen are typically brown or green or dark and heavy looking. And I spent, uh, I, I have a four year bachelor's degree in fine art from the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And I got out of school and thought, I love paper, I've always had a relationship with it, but I wanted to do something more durable. And so I went into bronze casting to study that. And what I found that for me was I didn't want the work to look heavy. I wanted to speak about light, and I wanted the work to look light, and I had this relationship with paper, so I thought I'm going to try and see if I can integrate paper uh, into lost wax casting and sculptural processes. So I pioneered over a seven year period, um, primarily after I got out of school in Austin, Texas, uh, there were a number of fine art foundries there, and I worked for other artists publishing their work in foundries, doing uh, lost wax bronze casting, and then some fabrication. And it was in that opportunity that I had the studio and the mentorship and the, um, the, the skills to pioneer this technique of capturing the delicate nature of paper in museum quality metals. And on the left there, on the, or on the, on the, on the left, on your left, um, you can see the sort of star pattern. Um, that's the kind of work that I started doing initially. I usually started with a square piece of paper or a rectangle, but I was just folding geometry looking for what I was describing at the time as the architecture of the soul. I wanted to, to describe what's invisible in our lives, the thoughts, the ideas, the feelings, the inspiration, and to me that sort of translated at this sort of geometric style. And that's an early work that was cast in aluminum using sand casting. At the same time I discovered that paper folding, um, like paper airplanes when I was a kid growing up, lent itself to fabrication. So. I was also cutting sheet metal and assembling it and looking at different ways that the engineered nature of folded paper could translate into fabricated work. When I began exhibiting this work, a lot of people said, oh, that's like origami. And I was like, what's origami? And all this time and energy spent in the studio translating paper into metal, I hadn't really looked into it or been exposed that much to it as a kid. Like I said, I, I folded paper airplanes, but people kept saying origami, origami, origami. And I was like, no, no, it's the architecture of the soul. You know, I have this modern vision and everything. But eventually I, I sort of succumbed and I thought, well, maybe I'll learn to fold some origami designs. And I, and I got a, a, a book that taught me step by step how to fold an origami crane. Any of you may have done that. It's a, it's a very challenging practice, um, but I was able to achieve it. And origami typically is a stylized form of an animal, like this horse, you might say. But in the next slide, we're going to see any of them, when you unfold them, have a beautiful star inside. And when I saw that, I, it was an aha moment. And I thought, OK, I am telling the story of origami. These sort of mandala patterns that I was playing with artistically <coughs> do relate and connect to origami. I was just holding origami on the inside. But what excited me about that was the fact that origami presented a simple metaphor and way as an artist that I could describe what we see with our eyes, what we see in the world uh, visually, and also uh, when you unfold it, this sort of invisible reality of complexity and detail and hidden meaning. And that really inspired me to embrace origami and sort of go on this, this journey of discovery. Uh, cast bronze and fabrication techniques became the, the process. And, I like to say lost wax casting is a very simple 35 step 12 week process and if you want to look more uh, into about how that's done, it's been around for 6,000 years, it's not new, but as an artist I wanted to do something new with it and so that's what I spent my time doing. We use rubber molds, so I still make every single piece out of a piece of paper originally and then we use uh, contemporary lost wax casting techniques and mold making techniques 
to pursue the process. So these are examples of molds of paper, rubber molds of scissors, and we would pour the wax, molten wax, into these molds and remove the wax and make a copy. And ceramic shell uh, casting is the primary technique we use. Um, but that's all beside the point of what is the art about and how does it uh, engage an audience. Um, I spent, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years now. The first couple of decades were working, I, I started out actually in outdoor art festivals. I know you guys have one here. And uh, that was a great way of getting out there and getting feedback and finding one collector at a time that would support my creative work. But eventually moved into art galleries and doing exhibitions around the country. Uh, this is an exhibition in Dallas. And you can sort of see the different scales of work from wall pieces cast in aluminum to these origami cranes cast in stainless steel. Big sculptures like that stone paper scissors that weighs thousands of pounds. And dabbling in public art along the way. But our primary um, uh, funding was through private art collectors. So we did commissions, both public and private. In 2012, my wife and I uh, built our home and studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's on a 35-acre piece of property of really significant rock outcroppings known as the Little Garden of the Gods. And right outside Santa Fe, New Mexico, you can see some of the rocks on the left side of the house there. And we had a master plan project with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture to sort of master plan the, the layout and where things would go with the idea that maybe we would translate this someday into an artist in residence program or a public garden of some sort. Um, we got a couple dogs uh, rather than having kids and, and we started making art. Um, this is, this is uh, me in the studio painting some of the larger versions of the the cranes that you guys have outside here. So we make work on all different scales. You know, we origami from the size of your hand to 30, 30 feet foot tall public pieces. And uh, this all was being produced out of our Santa Fe studio. And we started to develop a sculpture garden in the front yard because we're on a national scenic byway and people tend to park at our gate and be like, can we come in? So we started developing um, some programming and began opening in 2015 to the public. Uh, every summer and we have uh, hired staff to give tours and develop our sculpture garden and it's really what we consider our our our, um, our our laboratory you know we are sculpture gardeners you know we we have a sculpture garden in a high desert landscape you can see there's not a lot of plantings as perennials and soils and it's we get like 8 to 12 inches of rain a year but we can uh, plan sculpture and host tours, and we started developing this idea of creating an exhibition. And so in 2014, I know this seems a little bit backwards, but in 2014, we launched Origami in the Garden as a traveling exhibition. We've been doing these exhibitions um, in big art fairs around the country for years, and we thought, you know, it's all this work, we're doing it for like a week or two at the most, and we're pulling it all out. And I was like, what if we engage in a botanical garden community? And I grew up uh, studying graphic design in Atlanta, Georgia. My uncle had a firm there, and every summer we would go to Atlanta Botanical Garden, and they have this big, fabulous sculpture show. So Jennifer and I honestly were just like, you know, we have enough pieces, like, we can do this. We have collections at different scales, we have all these molds of limited editions. What if we were to cast a few things? In aluminum so they were a little lighter weight and easier to get in and uh, we just kept telling people this this is what we're gonna do and everyone was like well that's a good idea yeah you know do you know about this garden and that garden so we did it and um, Clayton Bass this is not him Clayton Bass was the director of the Santa Fe Botanical Garden at the time it didn't exist there was no botanical garden in Santa Fe and he came to an opening of ours at a gallery where we were talking about this launch and that we were going to build a masterpiece, this you know, sculpture of a thousand cranes. And he literally was like, you cannot go around the country doing this without starting here at our botanical garden. And I was like, what botanical garden? <laughs> we don't have it. He goes, no, we do. It's opening next year. And we should be the inaugural show. So he, it really did was like a, a, a moment of serendipity. And uh, he, he captured us. And we began the exhibit at the Santa Fe Botanical Garden. And then he quickly introduced us to the American Public Garden Association where we learned of all the gardens in the country pretty much are involved in this um, great dialogue together in that organization. And it's been a wonderful thing to be a member of that and interact with. 
Um, on the same side, you know, I want to talk about collaboration. You know, I realize I'm not going to be an origami master. I'm doing this the 35 step 12 week process. Sculpture is a all day job, let me tell you. It takes a year to take an original idea and finish it out in a sculpture, whether it fits in your hand or is 30 feet tall. And I thought, you know, I have ideas that I want to realize, but how am I ever going to teach myself origami uh, at the same time? So I decided, like a band might do, to reach out and ask one of the world greats. This is Robert J. Lang. He's probably one of the highest and most well-respected origami artists in the world. He has a PhD in physics, physics and has worked at JPL, but is a full-time origami artist and origami master, traveling the world and applying origami not only in complicated folded forms, but to engineering practices and applications for satellite deployment, um, medical devices, airbags. So his engineering background really lends itself. But he and I began collaborating in 2008 and the bison is, was the first collaboration that we did together. Uh, you'll see that in your exhibit uh, for, further out towards the edge of the garden. Um, I reached out to Michael G. LaFosse. This is one of the only origami artists in the world that actually makes the paper that he folds. So he's not only a master, masterful designer and paper folder, but he is a master paper maker. And to us, that was an important component to bring into this exhibit, working with botanical gardens and knowing the fact that Origami doesn't exist without paper, and paper doesn't exist without plants. So having that uh, opportunity to sort of make that content connection between paper making plants, that's an opportunity that the gardens can go out and identify paper making plants in their collections and sort of tie that in for uh, the work. He's known as the great butterfly designer, though. He's got these wonderful butterfly designs, and so this butterfly that he created uh, for Jennifer and I um, and in the entire sculpture called Emerging Peace, uh, which tells the story of the magical story of the transformation of a butterfly, uh, is going to be gracing your butterfly wing, which is really neat to have that butterfly interacting with other butterflies around it. Uh, so that's a great example of a collaboration uh, with Michael G. LaFosse. Beth Johnson is another origami artist and educator, really innovative uh, woman out of uh, Michigan, and we've been collaborating with her more and more. She's only got one piece in this exhibit, but we're bringing her in for more uh, complicated things as we move along. She did the seed, which goes with the squirrel, which is also a Michael LaFosse piece. And she uses some computer-aided drawing uh, and folding techniques and some uh, outside-the-box sort of techniques that the guys are all about, the uncut square. She's like, I don't care about the uncut square. Like, let me show you what you can do with something else. So I like her her ambitiousness and her boldness in some of her designs. So, TJ Fu was the very first origami artist that I collaborated with. I mentioned him earlier. We created the ponies together. Excuse me. <clears throat> and that uses a technique called kirigami, where you actually do cut the paper. And in China, which he's a Chinese artist, uh, they're a lot more crafty with their origami. They like making mobiles and adding uh, uh, jewels, actually, which you guys have a lot in the garden right now. And that's our collaborative signature on the back of the pony there. So his last name, Fu, literally translates as teacher or a tutor in Chinese. And my last name is Box, so we thought it would just be a fun little you know, chop to put on the back of the pony. And it reminded me of the brands that I used to see on ponies as a boy growing up in Oklahoma. Armijo, Tim Armijo is uh, the creator of Armijo's Mouse, our smallest uh, sculpture in the exhibition. He's literally the size of a mouse. And he's on a, a little rock up there in the dry garden. So we put this stuff all into a trailer and started touring it around the country. We have different scaled exhibits. We started out with a really big exhibit that takes tractor trailers and crates. And then we were at an ABGA conference and one of the smaller gardens was like, look, we love this. Can you do a smaller version? Because like this is way too expensive and we don't have heavy equipment and all this kind of stuff. Could you do? a smaller scale. So in 2017, we introduced Origami Garden 2, that's why we call it the Little 2, because it was kind of a second show, it was a smaller show, it was designed so that two people and a dolly basically could install the whole thing and they didn't need heavy equipment or major budgets. And we've been touring, there's actually two of this scale shows sort of moving around the country now. And that's uh, one of the ones, or that's the show that we have here. And we are working on a larger show right now for Atlanta Botanical Garden. It has sort of this 
um, very ambitious exhibit um, philosophy, and they are commissioning us a, uh, a show that's like you know the Pegasus is 18 feet tall, and new flowers and designs that we're really excited to begin exploring new subject matter. Um, most of the subject matter in the show that you see here was truly just in my inspiration as an artist over about a 10-year period. But um, the squirrel uh, and the seed was a commission that uh, the Morton Arboretum added to their collection, the emerging piece, the butterfly with the caterpillar, that was commissioned by Naples Botanical Garden. And now with Atlanta's commission, we'll be able to introduce a whole nother show in the coming years that will have different color and different themes that sort of integrate into uh, our shared mission in a lot of ways, which I think is to grow people to grow consciousness. I think gardens want to connect people with plants and grow and educate people in that regard, and we want to uh, connect them with art and the inspiration uh, behind the creative process. So we have uh, all the work is for sale uh, to some degree. Um, you know, like I said, all of this work exists because somebody bought it or commissioned it and uh, in galleries or public art settings, but primarily private collectors. So we integrated some of that smaller work into the gift shop. Uh, those are pieces that we sell at galleries around the country, and we thought we'd introduce it to botanical gardens. And my wife introduced t-shirts. She loves to see something that everybody can afford and give uh, kids a smile. So we threw some coffee mugs and t-shirts in there. Um, and these are some of the gardens that we worked with. The list has grown quite long since this uh, slide was made years ago. Um, but there we are. Uh, that gives you a sense of the scale of Atlanta show. That's 21 feet tall. We're doing one that's just two feet shorter than that, if you can imagine. It's going to be about six tractor trailers worth of work. But it's all fun, and, and the same themes at every show are basically can, uh, uh, brought through. So the signage um, will give you the title of the piece and the artist. If you'll use your smartphone, you can learn more. Every piece has a story and a reason behind it and sort of a philosophy. That sort of follows my philosophy of peace and the economy of peace. And so uh, with that, I'll open up if anybody has any questions uh, before we go outside and actually see some in real life. Come on. No questions? I answered them all. <laughs> yes, sir? Can, can you talk about how you decide on colors for some of the different, uh, you know, the, the different shapes and the patterns that you come Good up with? Good question. So, if you haven't noticed, white's my favorite color. And the primary reason why um, I relentlessly pursued that for so many years is the reason that I'm transforming paper into metal, and then I'm making it look like paper again. And there's no other color than white that our minds automatically tell our brains that it's paper. That's what we associate. It's the symbolic color of paper. It's also, uh, for me, the symbolic color of light that contains all colors. So uh, as you all may know in the, uh, what was it, the dark side of the moon installation that's going on out there, if light passes through a prism, <laughs> white light turns into and reveals all the colors. So there's a philosophical side to that as well. But really it's because if you see something white outside and it looks like paper, you know, it, it has that uh, iconography. But obviously color is something that I wanted to play more with. And um, the ponies were the first time we tried that. So part of it was I didn't know if, if we made it a different color. Obviously, paper co comes in different colors. If we made it in a different color, would it still look like origami? Because I've changed the scale and all these kind of things. And so the ponies were the first time we tried that, and it really did work. Felt like it was successful. It still looks like origami out there. And then the colorful birds that you see out here are those, those origami cranes. You know, I was pushing myself to do more color for the show because it is heavily on the white side. And so those were created specifically for this exhibit, um, looking at how do we also talk about the graphic nature and the different kinds of colored paper and design paper that uh, often is associated with origami. So those were 3D canvases. I wanted to have a, a canvas to paint on, so those are all hand-painted. They're 3D paintings, you know. Um, and they're different on each side because I discovered that I could do that. And it's kind of a cheat. You can't actually pull a piece of paper that would do that. But I thought it was fun that you can walk around it and, and discover something different. And the next show that we're working on right now, it is a massive push towards color. And part of that is because I knew years ago, as I began to adapt and take origami on as, a, as sort of a life theme as an artist, I knew from a design standpoint that it's going to be tough to exhaust 
as a, as a, a subject matter. And that over the years, there would be opportunities to bring in color, different um, subject matter. And so, you know, like I said, what you have here is like a 10-year exploration. And, and we're working on the next exploration now. So there will be a lot, a lot more to see in the future. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Are the pieces that you're creating, are you folding the metal the way that you would fold the paper? Good or question. are you producing pieces and putting them together? How does how do, how do those pieces come about? Good question. So lost wax casting is a, a technique where basically an artist can make anything out of anything. You can make a, an original out of clay, which is what we're more familiar with, with a, like a statue that you might see in a town square. Um, those typically start with clay. But an artist can bring in a stone carving, a wood sculpture, and you can bring in found objects. And although different ones present different challenges, when we make a rubber mold on any object, that's ultimately what we make the, the lost wax casting from. So in a number of the examples in the garden, it's a one-to-one, -one, what I call one-to-one -one scale model. So we've actually folded the paper and added, excuse me, added wax. So I engineer the paper model using wax to thicken it and re-sculpt it and fix the casting uh, requirements for lost wax casting. There's a lot of rules to make it work. And then we make a mold of that and we make a casting that's the same exact size as the paper original. As you get bigger, that starts to um, fail. And so I was telling uh, a group earlier today that when we first did the ponies, I thought, oh, I'll just fold a bigger one. And so TJ Fu and I got a 30 by 30 foot sheet of paper and we folded it into the pony and we stood it up and it was like tissue paper because even though the paper got wider, it didn't get thicker. And so to really have the same quality as the smaller model, you'd have to get paper that was like the thickness of cardboard. And so I discovered pretty quickly through that failure that that wasn't going to work and that I would need to adapt and use more traditional techniques that we use for other artists' work, which is enlargement. So we enlarged a lot of the sculptures here out of clay. So they're actually clay sculptures of the paper models. Um, so we don't fold all of them. And uh, the clay model gets a rubber mold on it just like any other piece would. And then it goes through a casting process where it's cast in multiple pieces and welded back together and then powder coated or painted. The, the birds out here, the colorful ones, are fabricated. And the boat is fabricated as well, which means we take sheet metal and cut it into the shape. And as scale gets larger, like the big Pegasus that was up there with Jennifer and I in front of it, as the scale gets to a certain size and, and if the design lends itself and it's simple enough, like a paper airplane, then we can cut sheet metal. We, we unfold the piece and sort of look at that crease pattern that intrigues me so much. And we'll decide which shapes are the exterior components of the artwork and we'll cut those out of big sheets of metal and weld them back together. Simple answer. <laughs> it, it really is a, a lot of work. I mean, what you all see here is is a ten year uh, grouping of work, and you know we've done them at different scales that that you know, and we're continuing to innovate on that every day. But it's it keeps us entertained, and we love this uh, opportunity to interact with the public in these settings because I wanted to do public art, and I, we've placed a number of pieces, but. The botanical gardens give us such a great opportunity to engage a different audience and a broader audience. People that might not want to go to an art museum or be interested in a gallery per se may find themselves in a botanical garden. And these settings are absolutely stunning for an artist, you know, to have a blank slate of a of a, of a garden like this to set the work in and see a consistent story being told in an experience that will get people into areas of the garden that maybe they haven't discovered before, give the garden opportunities to bring attention to different things. It's been a really great collaboration and the team here at Ryman Gardens has been exceptional to work with. I think Ed and his team have such an experience with exhibits. Obviously you all know we're not the only exhibit that's been here, um, but it's the first time we've ever installed an exhibit in a day. Like literally we got pretty much everything done. It's because they were prepared. They knew what you know goes into it and how to do it and where things were going. And we were just excited. So we've been kind of hanging out for the last couple of days waiting for <laughs> some of this final um, finish up. But, but excellent work uh, for you and your team. And it's, like I said, it's a, a real honor and a pleasure uh, and a treasure for us to be here. So with that, I think uh,
we've exhausted questions. Let's go out and actually see some pieces in the garden, and Jennifer and I will tell some stories. We love to share what we call our inside out exhibit, where we have a few examples of the paper models and that great question that was asked earlier about well, how do you do this? And, you know, every piece does start as a, as a, a delicate piece of paper. And so we have uh, uh, the Pegasus here, folded by Dr. Robert J. Lane. That's folded from a single uncut square of paper. No scissors, no tape, no glue, okay? And the, on the wall back here, we have unfolded examples just to prove it to you. I like to call it the paper proof. This is the Pegasus unfolded, just to give you a sense of the majesty that's beneath the surface, which I think we can all relate to in our own hearts and minds and thoughts and feelings. We know value is not just what you see on the surface, but what's beneath the surface. And I think origami really displays that very simply with this example. And it was Sarah's uh, idea in this situation to mix them up a little bit. She wanted to challenge your audience, which I thought was very creative and clever. So rather than putting them obviously in front of the pieces that they're unfolded, it is fairly easy to figure out. Uh, but this is the traditional origami crane that has a patterned paper. I folded that all by myself, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but that was an example of um, this origami crane out here, and so sort of give the idea of the inspiration of using patterned paper. And it's a simple origami crane. This is hundreds of years old from Japan. And this is what I call the piece pattern, which is the unfolded uh, crease pattern. Uh, of origami. That's the term origami artists use to describe an unfolded work. It's called a crease pattern. And there are a lot of reasons that origami artists use crease patterns. Um, for me, it's a spiritual experience of unfolding something to see this beautiful star inside, which I believe we all have within us. Um, but it also documents accurately every decision that was made in the creation of a design. So for me, again, uh, sort of philosophically, we all make choices that lead to outcomes. And in an origami, you can have different outcomes with a single uncut square of paper, all based on the different decisions that are made. And you can have very complex decisions, you can have very simple ones. And then um, uh, this is a butterfly out of the handmade paper that Michael LaBoss made the paper from scratch, designed the butterfly, folded it himself, and that's the unfolded version down there. Pretty cool, huh? I, I have to say, though, do not miss the exhibit that's inside the hall there that Ryman Gardens created with their own staff of the folded bugs with actual bugs in the display cases. It's one of the most impressive uh, exhibits we've seen the garden come up with. Very creative. So on your way out in the garden room, it'll be here for, I'm sure, most of the duration of the show. But it's a really neat exhibit. So with that, I'm going to go right, and Jennifer's going to go left. And um, so follow her and follow me, and we're going to just take her to the garden. So hang out on that side for a second, because you're going to see the patterns on one side of the screen, and then we'll come to the other side. Uh, I'll tell a quick story. That one's called Botanical Keys, and it talks, the, the subject matter that I painted on it is about the harmony that nature has. This one's called Blooming Stars. And it's a story that I, I believe. Do you know where flowers come from? Does anybody know? Come on, you guys are garden enthusiasts. You don't know the answer to that question? Well, as a kid, I used to ask that. Nobody ever knew the answer, so I made up my own answer. I decided that they come down from stars at night. The starlight reaches the ground and sows seeds. And in the daylight, they bloom as stars. So on this side, you see the artistic interpretation of stars or starlight. And if you walk around it, you'll see in the center of the flowers are the same sort of starlight uh, twinkling, but it's now blooming in the form of uh, flowering twinkling. See, I'm an artist. I get to make stuff up like this. Sure. <laughs> we'll buy it. Very we'll buy it. And this side, you can see the olive branches, which are a symbol of peace. And uh, on the first glance, you might just see the olive branches have olives on them. But if you look closely, some of them are actual musical notes, and you'll see that the birds are both ingesting the seeds of the plant, and they're also singing songs that are, you know, something beautiful that we can find in the So there's a 
next time I have an hour long botany class to teach about evolution of plants, I'm going to use that. I would ask. <laughs> I mean, does anybody know where flowers come flowers from? I mean, as a kid, that's a normal question. It is. But what do you say to that, right? Out here uh, in the center garden, we have the oldest or earliest work that's in the exhibit. And this really goes back to sort of showing the kind of style that I was developing when I was first pioneering the casting techniques and the foundry as well as my you know idea of making stars and sort of this symmetrical folded technique um, this is a self-portrait which is called star unfolding and we've all seen self-portraits by artists it's a little bit uh unique but doesn't it look like me would you say uh, i wanted to create a star you know my last name is box so i started with a square piece of paper and i began folding and this was just a a natural sort of pattern that emerged out of the process. And this was before I learned about what origami was. Um, so you can see how in the, in the crease patterns, uh, there's, a, there's a clear, obvious reference to one another. You could put this next to those and they all look like they're in the same family. Um, but since then, I, I've, I've really embraced origami and done a lot of different things. But, but that's uh, from probably 2004. popular favorite. So this was one of the ones that was created for Origami in the Garden and inspired in collaboration with another botanical garden called the Morgan Arboretum up outside Chicago. They wanted to unveil a new piece with their exhibition and so we talked about different ideas and subject matter. Being an arboretum, trees obviously are an important uh, component and this relationship of collaboration and mutualism found between um, animals and plants was a unique one. So we thought we would uh, collaborate and talk about the process of collaboration, not only with the artist, but in nature. Obviously, nature has this collaborative capacity to it as well. So this has three artists involved. Beth Johnson, as I mentioned earlier, designed the acorn. I started, this is actually where we started working together because I knew Michael's squirrel was the most famous uh, origami squirrel in the world. Like, it, if you Googled it, you know, everybody knew about it. And I was like, uh, I, we were already working together and he said, you know, Michael, I'd love to work with you and do the squirrel and bronze. And then I said, but you know, we need an acorn. So really, cause I connect it to the trees. And so I Googled acorns and it was like, they all led, all paths led to Beth Johnson. So I called her up and said, hey, do you want to collaborate on a project? And she was really excited too. So, you know, here are the art, these are really their designs. I didn't influence them uh, much at all as far as the forms, both are made well, excuse me, this one's made from a single uncut square using a technique called duogami. So Michael uh, used a paper that's two colors on each side, still one uncut square, right? But on one side it would be brown, on the other side this uh, silver. And he folded it so that one side of the paper would show as the belly and the rest would be the outside of the squirrel, which is a tremendous uh, engineering achievement with a single uncut square paper. Not to mention the fact that he made the paper himself. Um, Beth, though, like I said, she likes to think outside the box. Those are two different pieces of paper. Uh, so we call that modular origami, when it takes more than one piece of paper and you sort of fold them and put them together to create an object. And she used computer-aided uh, drafting to do the, the sort of curved creases on, the, on the, the seed part of the acorn. Those complex curves are so precise that if you were to hand fold them, and get them wrong, you can imagine a gear on, in, a, in a clock or a watch. If you don't get that exactly right, that gear is not gonna work. It has to be absolutely precise. So in that type of folding, she actually prints it out on paper with a computer and then creases it using the printed line as her uh, guide. So pretty neat, innovative techniques that she's bringing into the work on. Any questions? When you have um, involvement with other artists, is there some financial compensation to them? Are they getting a royal good, fee? Good question. Or? Absolutely. So um, we developed this sort of collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Robert Lang uh, 13, 14 years ago. And he and I initially had this idea, and then it evolved over time, and we've sort of massaged it out. But it does come down to royalties. 
that they provide the origami models and, and it's really important in the origami world that acknowledgement, A, number one, is there because a lot of origami artists are, are gets, their ideas are stolen or people use it. Uh, for instance, you may have seen a recent financial commercial with an origami squirrel running around it. And that's the initial squirrel that they had was this one. And after lawyers uh, discussing the situation, suddenly that squirrel changed and is no longer this squirrel. It's, you know, most people wouldn't notice the difference, but it, there's this lack of respect and understanding that this is an art form and these people are inventing these things. You can't just steal it because it's origami. The assumption is it's been around for ages. But um, the way we work with them is let's collaborate and, and we go back and forth. Sometimes we really are working from scratch from nothing, uh, from a model or an idea, and other times it's like they have a design within their portfolio that we really like and we like to work with, but they get a percentage of every single sale, and it's it's a significant amount over the years, and we believe in supporting artists and uh, uh, financially as well as acknowledging their work. So you'll notice every sign, it's very important that the artist names are acknowledged. It is a collaboration with me. Our, my expertise is metal. They don't know anything about the very simple 35 step 12 week process. And I can't design a squirrel from a single uncut square. So it really is like a band. And I refer to that over and over again because there's roadies, there's managers, there's, you know, there's all these expenses. And so we've created what we call the economy of peace where we're getting to be artists. We're getting our expenses taken care of. We are, when pieces sell, they're getting a percentage of royalty, uh, sort of like a publishing royalty, and it's been really great. And we've we've all really had to work on that over the years, but um, it's been a really good relationship. All right, let's keep going. This is powder coated cast stainless steel. So a lot of people don't know you can cast stainless steel with the same technique in lost waxes and pan bronze. And in fact, you can also pour uh, aluminum into the same mold. So the ceramic shell is really the technology of lost wax casting. That's the most important. I like to say anybody can melt metal. It's of what you pour it into that matters. And so ceramic shell is the technology that we use for that. And once that ceramic mold is made, uh, you can pour molten aluminum, bronze, stainless steel, gold, silver, whatever you, whatever you got in your uh, initially, everything I did was in bronze, and I transitioned to stainless steel because it's a much stronger alloy. It's a very, very uh, tensile strength. It has a lot of engineered uh, strength to it. So I can do these delicate things with small welds and very thin castings, and yet it's strong enough and durable enough to withstand transportation and uh, people touching it and things like that. Um, but uh, the story that this piece tells, this is also the very first origami design that I ever did. Uh, in metal. So this was my dates back to after the star unfolding. This was the first piece I did inspired by origami, and, and I wanted to tell the whole story about what we see with our eyes and the fact that origami can represent a crane or a piece of crane or whatever. But as you unfold it, this beautiful star emerges and is revealed sort of in the bottom of the piece. And so it's called crane unfolding. And this was a really sort of the aha moment for me. Um, I began exhibiting this, and this was the piece that sort of first sold and got me a lot of recognition and, and sort of primed the career to sort of keep evolving. Is this before the, the, uh, the airplane? No, good question. We're going to get to that. And okay. the airplane was a direct response to this. Okay. Because when I first exhibited this, of course, I'm trying to show this unfolding experience. Right. You know, this idea that at the end of our lives, we see our life flash before our eyes. To me, this idea that we unfold into a star, we can see all of our decisions and all of these things uh, was a very uh, profound thing. But when, when, when people first uh, interacted with it, a lot of them would go, oh, look, it's a piece of paper folding into a crane. And I would try to correct them, and people love to be corrected. And, uh, I found out that that was like a, a lot of effort, so I finally just quit, and I was like, well, they'll figure it out eventually, or they won't, whatever. But I should do one of a piece of paper folding into something, so that'll come up later. you provide the bases? Yeah, so these are just steel pedestals that we create uh, to give the, lift the pieces up a little bit and to sort of disappear in the landscape a little bit. Any questions? Good. Onward and upward.
So we won't necessarily see all the pieces today, but up here in the hillside garden, the raptor and the mouse is up there, uh, up in the far corner. <laughs> Again, the exhibit's designed to really get people into all different corners and aspects of the garden, and I think uh, Ed's team did a great job curating it. Normally we would come a year in advance and we would sort of curate it with them, but because of the pandemic, it was like, okay, well, travel is out, and we thought if any garden has the ability to curate it themselves, then these, these folks would, and so it was a really successful collaboration with them on that sense. Um, out in the water, we have our only floating piece in this exhibit called uh, Paper Navigator. with an origami boat floating out there in the lake, and uh, we call it Paper Navigator. It's inspired by a trip my wife and I took to uh, Hawaii, and... I learned about uh, paper making plants in Hawaiian culture uh, is, is, a, is a popular thing. They use a mulberry tree, which is a, also a, a popular paper making plant around the world. But what was interesting to me was the fact that when the Polynesian explorers populated the Hawaiian islands, they went out on these boats, you know, in this vastness of the sea to find these different islands, which is precarious enough. But with them, they brought plants. They had their little horticulture collection in the back of the canoe or the sailboat. And of course, edibles make sense, right? They brought the taro root, which is a popular food source for Hawaiian and Polynesian people. But they also brought mulberry tree saplings uh, for making paper, knowing very well that they, when they got to the island, they were gonna have to plant these and cultivate them for 30 years before it would even be useful. So that idea of the foresight was really inspirational. You know, these people were, were really thinking not far ahead as how to prepare for the next generation's success. And so we created the Paper Navigator to sort of homage to the, the paper-making navigators of the world. That's also fabricated out of shit. So I mentioned earlier that my wife and I built a house in New Mexico. You saw a photo of it. And we thought this was a great setting for this story because nesting care is really about homemaking and, and making a nest together, whether you're building a home or just living with somebody else. Uh, there's some compromise necessary in making a happy home. And when we built our house, uh, we were you know, looking at architectural plans and we you know, what if we put the kitchen sink over here? And oh, she's like, oh, we, well, I think we should put it over here. And we looked out the window and it was springtime. We saw these birds making a nest on our porch. And I saw one bird pick a twig up and put it on the other side of the nest, and the other bird came over and picked it up and put it back, and I was like, oh my god. We were like, just like these two birds, we're just building a nest. And I said, you know, I gotta do that. So I went to the studio, I got some rocks, I got the birds, and then we had removed some uh, olive trees on our property. And I thought, you know, olive trees, olive branches in the Greek tradition are a symbol of peace, and primarily through the concept of compromise that if you extend the olive branch, it means I'm willing to talk, I'm willing to listen, which is even more important than talking sometimes, as we all know. And, and in that and that listening and talking and understanding both sides, we're, we're, we're willing to come to an agreement that maybe doesn't give you all of what you want, maybe doesn't give me, but we're gonna compromise and meet the middle. And so I learned a little bit about that Greek philosophy in our history class in art school. And I learned about it in real life, building a house with my wife. And we used the olive branches cast in bronze to sort of tell that story of compromise that's necessary and make it home. And these have been very popular pieces with collectors uh, throughout my career. Let's go. Come on in. Come on in. Are you guys having a good time? Yeah. Is this an interesting afternoon outing? Very much so. Isn't it nice to be all getting along together in close yeah. proximity, <laughs> vaccinated and all that? Uh, well, that's, that's what this piece is about, right? It's about community. It's about gen different generations helping each other rise. And uh, so it's called Rising Peace. And it's a 
It's a good example of different scaled versions of the origami cranes that we've created. Our, our biggest crane has got like an eight foot wingspan. Um, we have these cranes in all different sizes. But it's a, real, a really good example of why stainless steel, again, the stainless steel can have a small weld and a small amount of metal that's really holding this weight and this delicacy up in the air. I couldn't do this with bronze. I should say, I could do it with bronze, but if you were to even pick it up, it would bend. It's a very soft metal. So stainless steel has really enabled me as an artist to be more expressive, to create more lift and lightness with a, what's a very heavy material and typically looked at as a, a heavy sculpture. You know, bronze sculptures usually look heavy. My whole idea is like, I want it to look light. So I love this piece because it's just a cacophony of fluttering light. And um, this idea that the different sizes of cranes can represent to different people depending on their own interpretation. A group of family or friends, you know, different generations helping each other out. Uh, but I love this piece. And using the natural stones, you can see it's kind of my, my sensibility of, of putting paper into the garden, but also having some elements of the garden in it. Any questions? Uh, a big wind come on, we haven't told them about the direction. <laughs> Most of the work, you know, we typically engineered a 99 mile per hour power wind that we were working on. On smaller stuff like this, it's not as much. But you can see there's not a lot of surface area, actually. Wind kind of blows through it. But when we do public pieces, like we have one of these that's 12 feet tall and all the birds are massive. You know, we get the engineers involved and they'll tell us. <laughs> I think horticulture did a great job and uh, we did a time lapse of them coming in and putting all the plants in around the sculpture and it was fun but I also just love the, the low white wall and how the piece just sort of comes up and lifts off and past it. So uh, great question earlier about the paper airplane sculpture. So after doing crane unfolding and hearing people say oh it's a piece of paper folding into a uh, crane I thought well maybe I should do that other side of the story. And because I grew up holding paper airplanes, not paper cranes, or, or doing origami, to me this was like a very American version of paper folding. Um, the creative process uh, for many is, begins with a blank page, right? Whether you're a writer, a mathematician, or uh, an artist, the idea of a blank slate, which uh, Aristotle talked about in his philosophy of, of, of the mind, uh, where things begin. We start with nothing. We have to form thoughts and then words and then write them down. And, and uh, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur making a business out of nothing or you're an artist with a blank page, um, this is the creative challenge. Is what are you going to do with nothing? And so to me, this piece really displays that concept of making something out of nothing, starting with a blank page at the bottom and it takes seven specific decisions or folds to make a piece of paper into a paper airplane, uh, to make a dream come true. And so I like to say this is a piece describing uh, a piece of paper that's dreaming of flying and then doing the work that it takes to transform itself into that. Um, it's great uh, for students to see this because they know they're sometimes in their studies or you know they don't know what they want to be or maybe they know what they want to be but they're not there yet. They're in these awkward asymmetrical moments in between and it's a good idea to see the process that you just have to keep going keep doing the work and eventually you'll you'll arrive at your goal the other aspect about this piece that i really like being in the exhibit is you know you've noticed that we're i'm pulling different themes sometimes it's a, a theme of peace and obviously origami and the origami crane has that traditional recognition but uh, we're going to get to the, the bison as a Native American uh, concept of peace. There's a, there's a pegasus which is a Greek tradition. We talked about the olive branches. But in an American tradition of paper folding, with what I consider to be American, the paper airplane is like very American to me. But it's actually a European uh, origin. It, was, it did not originate in Asia. Uh, paper was made about 200 to 0 BC in China, depending on uh, what research you are looking into. But that paper making as a technology traded very quickly out over the Silk Road, and other countries adopted that technology. And uh, Italy and uh, Spain were early adopters of paper. 
And you can see why the Pope would be so interested in paper and writing and archival documentation and the ease and the, and the usability of paper was very fascinating. So as paper was introduced to different cultures, paper folding naturally occurred. It's just our natural response to a piece of paper to pick it up and crease it. And then somebody says, oh, what if you put a couple of creases in it and what's going to happen? So Leonardo da Vinci himself could have folded this paper airplane, right? But Leonardo da Vinci was, was imagining things called airplanes, but they didn't exist at the time. So let me ask you, if Leonardo folded that, and there were no such thing as airplanes hundreds of years ago when he was alive, what might that have been? Can anybody guess? Yeah. Very good. I think you've been on a tour before. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it. So to the, they were, uh, it was uh, traditionally called an arrow or a spear, the tip of the spear. And we fold it today and we identify it with airplanes. Uh, but, but it just goes to show that paper folding and origami is a Japanese word that literally translates to paper folding, but the act of folding flat sheets is a universal response. Um, in Mesoamerica, there's a paper making tradition down there using the mulberry bark uh, that uh, Mayans would fold and write on. Uh, they would make headdress designs and ear decorations. Um, the Native Americans actually have a tradition of folding birch bark and biting it. They call it birch bark biting. And they make these little snowflake patterns. Everywhere in the world that something flat, that's paper-like, whether it be actual paper or not, has evolved into paper folding. And origami today is not an Asian practice. It is everywhere in the world people have folded more and more complex things. And I would say in the last 40 years, uh, origami has evolved more than it has in the last 100, 400 years. And that's due to all cultures and all people um, getting into what can be done with a single uncut square or or outside that, that constraint. Any questions? And this is another one that the individual pieces were, were formed and then they were assembled? Good question. So, uh, this piece lends itself to fabrication, and uh, I had I built a 21 foot tall version of this in fabricated aircraft aluminum. Uh, but this one is cast, and it's probably one of the most difficult castings I've ever created. Okay. The foundry and I were like, ah! Oh! It was a very challenging piece uh, because of the undercuts and the depth and trying to keep it mm -hmm. the same dimension. But I needed to create something that we could replicate easier. So it's easier to replicate with casting when you have a mold than it is to fabricate every single one from scratch. But it kind of can go either way. This is cast a little bit. So this is the first collaboration that I did with the uh, origami master, Dr. Robert J. Long, as I mentioned earlier, a PhD physicist who um, not only creates really complex origami designs and paper that are artistic, but applies that origami folding technique uh, for engineered purposes such as uh, satellite deployment and um, medical devices and airbag design. Um, so when we first started uh, the idea of collaboration, he said, well, what do you have in mind? You know, what do you want to do? And he said, well, you know, origami is uh, typically assumed to be this Asian cultural uh, you know, practice, but people all over the world are doing it. And I want to capture different images of peace that uh, people around the world have have might recognize the archetype, as I like to call it, um, of peace, like the, the paper dove, a white bird in many cultures is an archetype, it's a symbol of peace or the human spirit. So I said, well, I grew up in Oklahoma and I listened to a lot of stories about a white buffalo. And so I'd love to do a white bison and I obviously can't find uh, an origami book that has this design in it. And so I said, would you help and we'll collaborate on this idea? And he was like, sure. So he came, he flew to Santa Fe and we spent a week in the studio working out this design. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was not that challenged by the concept. He was like, oh, a bison, I don't agree, that's easy enough. Uh, it wasn't challenging enough. So he had brought what's called the duogami paper, which is silver on one side and white on the other. And this first uh, bison design that we created together is out of a single uncut square of paper uh, with the duogami technique see one side of the paper represents the back of the bison, the other side, the front, except for the horns and the eyes. And the patina on this, you know, genuinely represents that, what I 
like to call it origami Olympic maneuver there, where he folded the back side over so that we could show the two different sides of the paper and sort of match what he considered to be a simple design and make it a little more interesting and challenging for himself. Uh, but it was an incredible achievement, and I just I love this piece for that for that reason. Um, from a from a sort of a storytelling side of things, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma listening to a lot of Native American storytelling and sort of, uh, they have their own way of, of sharing wisdom and um, there's a number of them about the white bison and their spiritual beliefs in that and I'm not a Lakota Indian and I'm not, uh, you know, like uh, culturally uh, connected enough to that to really be able to convey it, but and there is a story that um, the settlers, when they first came to America, uh, observed that the natives already knew. And that is the behavior of the buffalo in a, in a great storm. And there's always something that we can learn from nature. And this one really made an impression on me as a kid. This idea that um, uh, when a storm came over the Rocky Mountains and down onto these, the big prairies of Kansas and the, and the Great Plains, uh, bison will turn towards the storm and actually run at it. And whenever the European settlers brought our, our modern cattle, and the, the, the cows that we have out today, um, you know, they're out there trying to herd and take care of their, their cattle. They noticed this, that bison would see the storm coming and they would just start to go towards it and eventually run at the storm while the other cattle would turn and run away from it. And then they'd be chasing the cows and the cows were running every which way and they would get separated. And if you think about it, if you're running with a storm, you're going to be in it longer, right? Because you're going in the same direction. And so you're getting caught up into the, the weather and the, and the exposure. And if you get lost, you know, things weren't happening. But if you run against the storm, what happens? Boom, you're on the other side. Well, the bison knew this. And I, you know, the, when, it, when it was taught to me, it was, it was conveyed in the idea of when you have a challenge or something that makes you uncomfortable, you're up against something in life, don't run away from it because you're, you're going to have to deal with it at some point. So you might as well just turn towards it, face it, and, you know, go into it and, and deal with it head on. And so that's been a, a, a helpful practice for me in my artistic practice of, you know, there's certain tasks I don't like to do but they have to get done. Um, but also in relationships, as we all know, some of the most challenging things are dealing with people. And we can run away from it or avoid it, but eventually it's gonna catch up to us. Or we can just face it and say, okay, can we talk about this? And like get, get this over with. And so it's interesting that we can learn things like that from nature, how to better navigate the world. And I think art is a great way of engaging people in those conversations. This idea was uh, that was me, uh, his, his, his little buddy. You know, you see the cranes and the birds picking uh, ticks and you know, flies off the backs of the cattle. I just thought it would be fun. This, I'll tell you, you know, what am I going to add to Robert Lang's so folding technique, okay? <clears throat> but some interesting things that I added that in our first relationship and creative encounter was to find out, are we going to be able to work together? And um, he had accidentally had a fold like this in the bison's face, and he had redone it so that it wasn't there. Because as a as a master and a perfectionist as he is, he knows how to get every crease just where they need to be and none where they don't need to be. And I love the idea that there were extra creases because it kind of shows the paper. And so uh, he was like, oh, well, you, I mean, I can do it without it. And I'm like, yeah, but it's nice, you know, go ahead and, and let's leave that one in. In fact, can you make another crease? And I was like adding creases, and he's like, but why would you do that? It doesn't need to be there. And I'm like, but it's artistic, you know, and it shows the paper, it shows creases. It's just a origami symbol, right? That's like what we relate to. And then, and then the other way that I did is I, I wanted to add these wrinkles. And he's like, well, why would we, you know, do that? And, you know, he's this like engineer, very science-minded person. And I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, bison are shaggy on the back. And, and wrinkles and crinkles in paper are also something we all identify with paper. It's like, it lends itself to what does paper look like? And so I said, you know, I just want to put some wrinkles in. And he never would have done that. But at the end of the day, we both looked at it and we're like, you know, oh, this is really great. And, and over the years, we've discovered that, you know, collaborating, working together means you, you let the other try some things. And in the end, 
you know, I add things to the designs that he never would have done, but in the end, you know, add something special that make it a little bit more unique. And obviously, he brings something to the table that, that I can't do. One uncut square. Where would the corner be? Uh, that's a good question. Definitely the the tip of the ear and the tip of the tail. I think the other two would be hidden. We have an unfolded one online. Yeah, we can check out. Oh, it's, yeah. it's a good question because you know origami. So it all starts with a square, and, and there's there's two first step options that typically happen. You either fold it on a square, you know, in half in the middle, or you fold it on a diamond, right? Like that. And so, not um, the ones in the exhibit hall are all hung on a square, but if you look, the crane folds on a diamond that can be hung as a as a diamond, and this one hangs as a diamond. My preference. It's neat when it's unfolded. So the unfolded version of this, we have multiple titles. Robert uses opus numbers, he's a, a, a fan of classical music, and he thinks of it as composing. So he has opus number three, six, uh, Obviously, it's a white vice, so he called it that. But I, you know, again, growing up in a moment with buffalo robes, and the Indians often would stretch these robes and draw treaties or paintings or document the battle or something. the head is in the corner and you and it, and it really looks like the skull of a bison with it's like sort of horns out. Hey. The first origami piece he folded was an origami frame. And so with his artwork, he started um, creating pieces that always had one crane in it. And then we got married. And I was like, hey, buddy, where's your second crane? So this piece here is called Duo. And that's not dirt. That's flies on there. For some reason, they, they apparently like the bright color there. But um, Kevin and I started collaborating. I started working with him in 2008. And in 2008, we started working together on um, Duo, as well as there's another piece over there, and some of the pieces that have the olive branches in it, they're all pieces that we worked on together. My thinking behind it was the very first piece that we collaborated on was um, a long branch like this that had you know, cranes on it. I loved looking out of a yeah, small condo, 800 square foot condo, and you see the little birds gathering together. Well, one day they started making a nest up in the um, little sconce, and it was really fun to watch because one bird would go up there and plant, you know, move, put some uh, twigs in there, and then the other bird would come in and move some twigs. And then I swear, the first bird would go back and take out a twig, and then the second bird would go in there and move the twig they just put in. And I realized at the time we were building our home and we were doing the same exact thing with our architectural plans. Here I am like, no, the bathroom needs to be closer to the laundry room. He's like, no, the laundry room needs to be up there. And back and forth, we kept moving our twigs. So again, that idea of art imitating life and life imitating art, so we collaborated together and started making artworks together. So this piece here is called Duo. There's two of us. I gotta be represented. <laughs> Being from New Mexico, I'm not even used to stepping on grass. So I'm always just like, I'm like, oh wait, can I go over here? So these here are called our painted ponies. This was the first collaboration that um, Kevin worked with TJ Food. And he already told you the story. So imagine he was trying to fold this pony out of real paper. And that piece of paper was 30 foot by 30 foot. And I have photos of it, and it is hilarious to see. I mean, they kind of try to stand him up, and his head is like toppling over. So it's also a good learning lesson to see that the first time you do something, you don't always succeed. You know, time after time, you have to try it, um, find better techniques, and be able to improve on it. Again, 
again, the bright colors of the uh, origami ponies, more like the traditional origami papers. Kevin, of course, started with white paper most of the time, and that being because when he started trying to pioneer the technique of being able to transform paper into bronze, he actually had a warehouse right next door from the foundry he was working at. It is filled with paper, and they were closing down. Like, if anyone needs paper for any reason, we're closing down. We're not moving anything out of there. I mean, how serendipitous, right? So here my husband is, like, interested in sculpture, working with paper, and a complete shop just closes down. So he went, he walked out of there with, like, rolls of paper. And so he was able to always practice while he was working in the foundry to be able to figure out how to work with paper and be able to pioneer this way of um, working from paper to metal. But like I said, so that's why he originally started working with white paper. But as soon as he started working with TJ Fu, the Chinese origami artist, he loves paper. TJ Fu is all about, you know, the sparkles and the, um, uh, the gems that can hang. So I don't know if you've ever seen origami hanging, they'll put the gems hanging and then an origami crane. He loves, like, bright colors and everything. So that's, that was to sort of represent TJ's flair, should I say. actually at our home garden, somebody came in and was like, that does not say food. And we were just like, okay, what do you think it says? They're like, we don't know, but that is not, the Chinese character is incorrect. And I was like, okay, so I'm emailing TJ Fu, I'm calling him up, I'm like, what's the story? I thought this was, you know, did we do it wrong? Come to find out, his mother had a specific way of signing their last name, and it was her Chinese character. So he told me, by golly, that is my mama's signature, and that is exactly how it's supposed to be. And so Fu means either tutor or teacher in Chinese. So we like that uh, box and uh, um, Chinese characters come together to make that chop kind of on the back of the pony. And we made the larger one first, and then we just felt like we had a couple of just the big ones, and they were too um, stoic almost, very stagnant. And then we decided to add the dancing ponies. They're a little bit more fun, and the foes are having a good time. You can see its little tail up and his head twisted a little bit. So I just saw the animals over at the veterinarian hospital yesterday, and there was a mama and a calf, and it was just like, look, again, life is art, and art is life. Is uh, that you can either call it the origami boat or the origami hat. And so he's floating there in your pond, and everyone always asks, is he going to move around the entire pond? And no, he is actually anchored, so he'll only move in about around a, you know, a 10 foot diameter. But that piece was actually um, inspired from a trip that we took to Hawaii. And we were um, enthralled about the Polynesian culture, how when people were coming over to Hawaii to the lands, they were actually, to the island, they were bringing paper making trees with them. And we just found that interesting because we always like to be forward thinkers. And I thought, wow, that's really forward thinking that they were thinking, you know, we need rope and paper. So they brought over, um, I believe it was um, mulberry trees, but I could be wrong on that. I'd have to look that up again. But when we were there in Hawaii, of course, my husband's enamored by all the boats as well. Again, living in New Mexico, we don't have water. So, you know, the boats we enjoy immensely. And uh, when we came back, we definitely wanted to design a boat. A funny, fun part of it was, now, where do we float that boat? In New Mexico, right? So we had to put it in um, our arroyo, which is a dry river. And so our arroyo, we tend to um, rake the sand. So it has different patterns. It's a Japanese um, art form. So we'd like to really make different ways. And sometimes uh, we'll make circles around some of the rocks. We'll make it look like water running down the arroyo. And then we'll put the boat right there on the sands in hopes that maybe some water will come. And in fact, one time it did, it stormed. We've got water coming down. We got so nervous. We're like, oh, we have to go check the boat. 
the boat moved maybe about two feet. We're like, okay, it went for its adventure. That's about all we had for our New Mexico adventure. But he's, um, he has foam in him, so he'll continue to float. And I love that, he'll tack. So like, you know, it's, he'll move in the space. He doesn't stay stationary. He'll get a little dirty. The pond is dirty. Guess what? That's life too. It's okay, right? And later when you're on your own, you can just take a look real quick. There's an origami crane right there. And um, that origami crane is created by Robert J. Wang. And that is the most complicated origami folding crane to date. It's complicated. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, life is complicated. And so it's a good journey and a life lesson to know that not everything comes easy. Some things are complicated, but the outcome is even more magnificent when it's that complicated. <laughs> so this is the um, origami piece. This is the first one that Kevin did independently. So when Kevin um, discussed, like he was saying in the talk earlier, he was folding um, paper and people kept coming up to him. And we were in Texas at the time, so they called it origami. That's what looks like origami. <laughs> and he was like, no, I'm not trying to make origami. I'm trying to make art that is explaining the architecture of the soul, the inside. When he first folded origami, he decided to fold an origami crane. And so that's what's located way up here on the top. You see the basic origami crane. This piece actually unfolds the origami crane. It's called crane unfolding. So there's the crane. And as when he folded the crane, he remembered seeing some steps and um, some sort of designs and architecture that he liked. So he unfolded the crane a little bit and he found this shape here. And he unfolded the origami crane a little bit more and he found this shape here, which I think is super fun. It's got the movement in it, right? Like, shoom, it's flying off. And then this one here, when you unfold it a little bit more, it actually made for a, you know, a nice face part of it. But when you completely unfold the piece of paper, down here is where you see, again, that origami star. So this is called crane unfolding. Again, made out of, you know, nice strong materials, cast stainless steel, powder coated. And one thing that people, this one I really see because we're a little bit more close up. Do you see that? You can come closer too. Do you see that there's like a brown color on some of the piece? And I'm not trying to say the bugs, but uh, like when you look at it here and here. So what happened was when we were creating, when Kevin was creating the artworks, they looked way too white. We would paint them, and and that in itself, boy, that upset other artists. They just couldn't understand, why are you painting the beautiful bronze or stainless steel? You know, they were very upset because usually you make something out of bronze to be able to show that patina and how it ages and everything. When Kevin started making it white, they were like, I just don't get it. It looks like paper. And they were like, and Kevin's like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted to do is look like paper. But it still wasn't. It was looking more like porcelain or um, ceramic. So now he applies a resin, this little mixture that he makes up, a wax resin, and he'll just brush it on those edges. Because if you've ever had a piece of paper and you kind of get it from somebody, you write a name down, you fold it, and you put it in your pocket, the next day it's not as fresh and crisp. It has your oils in it, so it's got a little discoloration to it, and those lines have collected any dirt in your pocket, things like that. So once he started doing that, everyone really, you know, at the art shows and first seeing the work, they never said, oh, what is that? Is it made out of ceramic? Is it made out of stone? Now people said, wait a minute, is that paper? And that is when he knew, all right, I'm done. I think I've got a, you know, a good technique here. So crane unfolding. This, a little tidbit that you won't find on any audio tour or anything, but my husband and I met at this piece. So in Santa Fe, um, I moved to Santa Fe on a Wednesday. On Friday, I met my husband at a gallery exhibition. And he was talking to me about this piece and he was telling me about that. Cause I, of course, I, I was like, it's folding into a crane. He's well, actually no a man, he liked to correct me right away, right? <laughs> no. He was able to explain to me his thought process of it unfolding to explain the architecture of the soul, similar to origami being the crease pattern. And I thought, 
boy, this guy, like he's either got it or he's full of it. And I wasn't <laughs> quite sure which way to go. But after a couple of months of dating, I figured it out. He's got it. So, yep, that's the piece we met under. What we like about him is when you're walking up to it, it's a little abstract. People still wonder, you know, if for the first time seeing it, what is it? Is it a Chinese food box? Is it a crown? I mean, we've heard a lot of different things. And by no means does, does it offend because it's exciting that people are trying to figure it out. But they're origami cranes, and we call them standing cranes because their wings are still up. If you just took their wings down, they would be the traditional origami crane that you see in the other artwork. So this crane, this wing just came down, you would see it's a uh, traditional origami crane. But did you recall it being yellow and orange, or were they other colors? So if you explore on the other side, because we started on this way, you could see the um, different colors in the different themes. This piece here is called Blooming Stars. And on this side, you have a nice star pattern. And on the other side, it looks like blooming little flowers. And within each of the flowers, though, you still have the design of from the starry night. Um, Kevin and I tell this piece two different stories because I did actually have a dream where um, I had I had a little dog, Bella, and I had these flowers that came up in my backyard, and it was some kind of um, Bell's Blossom or something. I'd have to look at the name again. And um, apparently more in Arizona, dry areas, when you get a lot of water, they'll pop up and then they'll disappear. And um, I just kept thinking, I was like, where did those flowers come from? It was just shocking to me because in New Mexico we don't have many flowers. So I dreamt of it one night that the flowers were actually coming from the stars. And the stars just landed in my backyard and then bloomed flowers. And it was amazing to me. And so Kevin and I were having this discussion and he just loved the idea. He's like, you know, as artists, I could think, where do flowers come from? And he's like, I can say the stars produce the flowers. You know, as an artist, you can say that, right? And then this piece here is called um, Botanical Piece. And you can see the theme. This art, you know, much more colorful, definitely inspired from us visiting and working with the botanical gardens.